not just to change things up, but just to uh, let God do some things within each one of us. And he's been doing a lot within me over the last um, oh, three or four weeks as I kind of tried to put this together. And um, looking at this Torah portion and looking at other connections throughout Scripture and just kind of all over, he's really been really been doing some work. So um, I got with some of these men on the list here and uh, gave them some scriptures and we'll see what God does with it. Uh, they may add scriptures to it. They may just read what's there and not anything else. They may share for 20 minutes. They may share for two seconds. I don't know. Um, but as we all know, faith comes by Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So we're going to try and get some word of God going today. Get some hearing. Develop our faith. Um, shalom. Shabbat shalom. He'll need a handout. Um, the way this is going to work, um, this, this is just kind of a list of who's going to come up here and speak. What we're going to going to read and either share on. And then we're each going to offer a prayer afterward. In between the newlyweds, which I guess they were here, they're still here somewhere, they're going to be offering praise in between, so kind of get us standing up, moving around. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> so, and then afterward, whenever we end, which there's no time limit or anything, we're just going to go however the Lord leads in this, uh, we are going to have... Some finger foods and drinks and fellowship and uh, shower some love on this little couple over here and on Dallas back there because this week they're loading up and getting out of Dodge. So and they'll need help packing this week if you're available and want to lend a hand. And Thursday's loading day, is that correct? Thursday night, loading night. So Thursday night party at the Lees. <laughs> right. All right, before we get started, I want to offer a quick prayer and then uh, we'll jump right into Exodus chapter 10. Yahweh, thank you so very much for allowing us to come together on your day that you have set aside to meet with us. I praise you that we can meet together and share in fellowship, share in your word. I praise you for the way that you orchestrate things in our lives and for the things that you do, you do for us and the way you enable us to reach out and touch um, people that we come in contact with every day. I thank you for your word. I pray your, your blessings as we study today and as we learn. May our hearts and minds be open to what you want us to teach, what you want us to learn. Um, may we just give you praise, pure praise from our heart and worship you and adore you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for Yeshua. I pray in his name. Amen. All right, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 10. And I'm going to read a little bit. Shabbat Shalom. Chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these miraculous signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt partially with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am Yahweh. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, this is what Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. 
They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your fathers nor your forefathers have ever seen from the day they settled this land till now. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Shabbat Shalom! Pharaoh's officials said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go, so that they may worship Yahweh their God. Do you not yet realize that Egypt is ruined? Then Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go, worship Yahweh your God, he said. But just who will be going? Moses answered, We will go with our young and old, with our sons and daughters, and with our flocks and herds, because we are to celebrate a festival to Yahweh. Pharaoh said, Yahweh be with you. If I let you go along with your women and children, clearly you are bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship Yahweh, since that's what you have been asking for. Then Moses and Aaron were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. And Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over Egypt, so that locusts will swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields, everything left by the hail. So Moses stretched out his, hand, his staff over Egypt, and Yahweh made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields and the fruit on the trees. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray to Yahweh your God to take this deadly plague away from you. Moses then left Pharaoh and prayed to Yahweh. And Yahweh changed the wind to a very strong west wind, which caught up the locusts and carried them into the Red Sea. Not a locust was left anywhere in Egypt. But Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. Right, before we move on to any other of these scriptures, I want to set the scene for you. This is the land of Egypt, and there's a little group of people, well, okay, not little, there's a big group of people who Pharaoh's scared of, made him his slaves. You were back the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how um, being set apart. This group of people is set apart. They're seeing this plague, they're seeing all these things come on. And um, who was here? about three or four weeks ago when Jay did his talk on water. Good, Jay, I'm glad you were here. <laughs> Does anyone remember offhand um, how much water weighs per gallon? Eight pounds. Right. Does anyone remember how much water weighs one inch rain per acre? A bunch. A bunch. Good, good answer. Okay, to set the scene, this is the land of Egypt, um, and as it says in verse 15, the locusts covered the ground until it was black. Just think about that for a second. Think about anything covering the ground anywhere you've ever been, completely, other than your carpet. Has anything, anybody ever experienced anything like that? Snow. Snow. Good. Volcanic ash. Volcanic ash. Good, good, okay. Because I got to thinking and doing some math, and um, <laughs> it's a bunch. Well, I got to thinking about it just to kind of get to get the scene because um, what you're going to see as we go through, as each man reads, is kind of like little strings. Like, this is obviously talking about locusts, so guess what? The next scriptures I'm going to read are going to mention locusts somehow, some way. Darkness, firstborn, and so on and so forth. Um, but before we move on to the other ones, I want, to, I want to set the scene. Okay, so if you remember, an acre of water one inch deep. was about 225,000 pounds. 
Is that about right, Jay? <coughs> One acre. One acre? Okay. Now, what I want you to imagine and think about and just pretend, because maybe it's true, maybe it's not. You know, a gallon of water weighs 8.2 pounds. How much does a gallon of locusts weigh? Less. 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 Considerably less. I'm going to, just to throw a number out there to make the math really easy, one-tenth. Okay? So, if water, a gallon of water weighs 8 pounds, a gallon of locusts is going to weigh 0.8 pounds. Are you with me so far? Just a number, maybe totally inaccurate, but just to make the math easy, because that's how I think. So, an acre of locusts, one inch deep, 22,500 pounds. One acre. The acre is not a huge plot of land, but it's pretty good sized. And if you remember when we talked about how big, how many acres are in a square mile? Who remembers? 640. Yeah, so 640 times that number is a bunch. I don't have all the intermediate numbers here. Um, let's see, let me get back to this one. Ah, that is on the back of here. Da, da, da. So 640 acres, so that's a square mile of locusts, give or take 150 million pounds of locusts. Creepy, crawly, six-legged, crunching under your feet bugs. Yes, Jim? Back in the day, if they had a swarm of locusts go across the railroad <coughs> tracks, the trains couldn't move. Because you squish bugs, it gets slimy. Uh -huh. Shabbat Shalom! Shabbat Shalom! So just imagine, they, they probably had a hard time going around because they're slippery. Has anyone ever seen any kind of swarm or thing of insects? Flies, mosquitoes, whatever. They're not usually an inch thick, right? Okay, so we're just using this just because it makes the math easy. Alright, so this is a square mile. Anybody remember how big Lubbock County is in square miles? 900 square miles. Pretty good sized. Let me see if I have that number. I don't know if I have that number written down on this page or not. Anyway, it's a whole bunch. So that's Lubbock County. We're just going to do that. So take this number times 900. So you're just, you're just adding lots and lots and lots of zeros. That's a little bit county. 900 square miles. We're talking the land of Egypt. The land of Egypt is roughly 387,000 square miles. Texas and New Mexico combined, roughly. <laughs> Using the same math, you're gonna love this number. Shabbat Shalom. All right. New Mexico and Texas. Combined is roughly 386 something thousand. Minus Goshen. Yes, minus Goshen. How big was Goshen? So minus Goshen. So 300 and, we'll just say 386,000 square miles. <coughs> minus Goshen, whatever that is. Okay. So the land of Egypt. One inch thick of locusts, which weigh one tenth of the amount of water, just to make the math easy. I gotta hold this number, there's too many zeros, I don't wanna miss any. Fifty five trillion nine hundred billion pounds. So that's where John the Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonder he wasn't 600 pounds, huh? 
No, that's just the weight. Yeah, and that, that's, that's taking a gallon of locust weighs one-tenth the amount of a gallon of water, and it, that's one inch thick. Roger. And every one of those locusts has got to eat. And every one of those locusts has got to eat. And this was in their houses. This is after the hail, remember that, because we're setting the scene. Well, I, what I really got from, the, from reading it as well is that, that it, speaking of all of that, because, I mean, they came after the hell. So the hell was destructive enough, but then it was to make the land desolate, to make sure that it was like, look, this will not be livable. Yeah. And it was to prove that point to that harsh reality that nothing's going to grow here. Yeah. Nothing's going to be able to survive. There's nothing to survive. Exactly. It's going to wipe out everything. And what did, what did God say right in the first part of chapter of chapter 10, why he's going to do the miraculous signs, yeah. is so that the Israelites will pass it down to their children and their grandchildren know that this is God. So just food for thought, 55 trillion, 900 billion pounds of bugs, just to set the scene. And remember, you're set apart. It's like being inside this building and all those bugs all the way to Louisiana, to Arizona, from where we sit. Think about that. Yeah, buffet, it's on. Good point. Everyone hear that? Locusts are kosher, so Israelites were like, cool. <laughs> Egyptians, not so much. They worship Weren't the locusts one of their gods? I wasn't there, I don't know. We'll, we'll pass on that point. Could be. They've had all kinds of gods for all kinds of things, I'm sure. So. All right, so that's the scene this week in the land of Goshen. We've got locusts as far as the eye can see and then some, except where you are. So you're safe inside the building and locusts are everywhere else. Okay, and a couple things just out of this section real quick before we move on. Uh, verse five and six. They will cover the face of the ground so they cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your fathers nor your forefathers have ever seen from the day they settled in this land till now. Then Moses left. Verse 14 and through 16 is God fulfilling what he said he was going to do. Proving. Okay, I said I'm going to do it. Here it is. And one of the things that jumped out at me this morning that I hadn't seen before was in verse 14. Uh, invaded all of Egypt, settled down in every year of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts. And what does it say next? No will there ever be again. All right. Let's move over to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And as we read, kind of picture in your mind this scene, this that the Israelites saw, this whole thing happened. They witnessed everything here. They saw all the locusts. They heard the buzzing and the clicking of the legs and the wings and all the stuff they left behind as well. Mm -hmm. All right, Deuteronomy 28. And of course, this is the section on curses for disobedience. This is right after, hey, if you obey, it's going to be good. If you don't, it's going to be really, 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 really bad. And I want to pick up in verse 36 and just read a few verses here. So Deuteronomy 28, verse 36. The Lord will drive you and the king you set over you, key point, the king you set over you, not the king I set over you, very key point. The Lord will drive you and the king you set over you to a nation unknown to you or your fathers. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone. You will become a thing of horror and an object of scorn and ridicule to all the nations where the Lord will drive you. You will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little, because locusts will devour it. Do they know what God was talking about? Mm -hmm. You will plant vineyards and cultivate them, but you will not drink the wine and pour gather grapes, because worms will eat them. You will have olive trees throughout your country, but you will not use the oil, because the olives will drop off. You will have sons and daughters, but you will not keep them, 
because they will go into captivity. Swarms of locusts will take over all your trees and the crops of your land. Remember, this in Deuteronomy is before they're going to go into the promised land. Remember, it's only been a short 38 years or so, or 40 years since they saw this. So these people think understand what's being said. Verse 43. The alien who lives among you will rise above you higher and higher, but you will sink lower and lower. He will lend to you, but you will not lend to him. He will be the head, but you will be the tail. Verse 45, all these curses will come upon you. They will pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed. Because you did not obey the Lord your God and observe the commands and decrees he gave you. They will be a sign and a wonder to you and your descendants forever. Because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity. Therefore, in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and dire poverty, you will serve the enemies the Lord sends against you. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. Ouch. So not good. But when you get to chapter 30 and you realize, okay, after all these things I've done to you, then I'm going to bring you back. If you turn back and obey. So that's kind of, I think, where we are now is we're turning back, trying to help other people turn back and um, get out from underneath some of these plagues and curses. Just a personal thought. That's not what it means to me. Well, God doesn't really care what it means to you, Mr. Hill. What does it mean to you? I'm sorry. All right. It doesn't matter. Exactly. All right, flip over to Joel. How does this equate to God is in control? Uh, how does this equate to God is in control? God is in control. That sums it right up, right? And if you don't do what he said, he's going to show you that he is who he said he was and he's going to do what he's going to do and he's really in control. Because if you think about that chapter 28, how long is the section blessings for obedience? It's kind of short. How long is the section curses for disobedience? Considerably longer. Just saying. Yeah, he's going to show you he's really in control. Okay. Joel chapter 1. Um... Yeah. Joel 1, going to read 1 through 10. And of course here, um, I think there's kind of a double meaning with the locusts in this passage. Maybe the physical locusts, it also uh, in a lot of ways refers to nations and armies and things like that. And particularly in chapter 2, the army of God. So, Joel 1, 1 through 10. Then the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? What happened in the days of your forefathers? 55 trillion, 900 billion pounds of locusts. Okay. Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all of you drinkers of wine. Be wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. <coughs> Not a pretty picture. Look over to chapter 2. And chapter 2 describes an army of locusts, army of God. And the priests in the middle of chapter 2 are not necessarily repentant, but wonder what's going on. Seeking God. Verse 18. Then the Lord will be jealous for his land and take pity on his people. The Lord will reply to them, I am sending you grain, 
new wine and oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern army far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land, with its front columns going into the eastern sea, and those in the rear into the western sea. And its bench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Be not afraid, O land, and be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Be not afraid, O wild animals, for the open pastures are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, O people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. So I just said how bad it's going to be in chapter 1, and it's going to be restored in chapter 2, much like Deuteronomy 28 and 30. Curses for disobedience, and then in chapter 30 when we get brought back, and those curses are actually transferred to the enemies. All right, one more, Revelation chapter 9. Didn't quite get to maps, Alan, but I got close. <coughs> <laughs> Revelation 9. You can remember who he's talking to. Remember the history that they know. They know this event in Egypt there. Of course, this is in the middle of the trumpets. And uh, chapter 9, verse 1. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their